First of all, welcome to the Q&A session for the FMP program, the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at Frontier Nursing University. One of our missions, one of our goals is to create a culture of caring at the university. Next slide. Um, let's take a minute and introduce everyone that's here. I'm Dr. Lisa Chappell. I'm the chair for the Department of Family Nursing at Frontier Nursing University. Catherine, would you, Dr. Arterberry, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Catherine Arterberry. I'm the clinical director for the uh, Family Nurse Practitioner Program here at Frontier Nursing University. And we have uh, Ms. Jamie Wheeler. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie and I'm the clinical advisor for the FNP students. So I will meet with you at Frontier Bound. We'll talk about search strategies, tips for getting yourself oriented to this process. And I will be a helping hand for you um, up until you're turned over to your clinical faculty member. So I'm here to get you started on the search process. Thank you, Jamie. And we have um, staff here from the admissions department. I'll go first. Uh, this is Katie Moses. Uh, I am an admissions officer and I'm just here for any questions that you may have about the admissions process and those sorts of things. Thank you, Katie. Hey. Oh, sorry. Hey, uh, this is, I'm Rainy Boggs. I'm the Director of Enrollment Management and Financial Aid, and I'm here to represent uh, the financial aid. So if you have any questions regarding financial aid, I'm also the VA certifying official, and I can answer any questions you may have about your VA benefits. And welcome. Thank you, Rainy. We also have members of our marketing department. Um, Brittany, you and Rosalind, would you introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Brittany Kinnison, Director of Marketing and Communications at Frontier. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rosalie Seitz. I'm the Marketing and Student Recruitment Coordinator. Okay. Anybody else, faculty and staff from Frontier? Yes, this is, sorry, Lisa, this is uh, Tiara Carlock. I am a Social Media and Communications Manager for Frontier. Great, thank you so much, Tiara. Did we miss anybody else? Is that everyone? Well, um, audience, you will see that we work as a team together uh, to help students not only apply, but move through the program. So um, we be believe very strongly in a team approach to education. Next slide. This is our mission statement for Frontier Nursing University, and I'd like to read it to you because it is extremely important to us. This is how we manage, develop, and grow at the university. Our mission is to provide accessible nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner education to prepare competent, entrepreneurial, ethical, and compassionate leaders in primary care to serve all individuals with an emphasis on women and families in diverse rural and underserved populations. And this uh, mission statement is something that we use as a reference point in many ways. Next slide. Let's see, distance education. We do, um, we adopted a culture of caring several years ago, and it is something that we um, use as guidelines for our communication and relationships with each other, with students, and it is something that we expect and will help educate students in that culture of caring. You use your community as a classroom because we're a distance education program. Your work will be done at home and your clinicals will be done within your community. You do study from your home. There are two times that, that uh, students have to travel to Versailles, Kentucky. Once is for orientation at a session we call Frontier Bound. And the second time is um, a session called Clinical Bound where you come for preparation to start your preceptorship hours. And we have a brand new campus in Versailles that students and faculty come and work together. Next slide. 
some of our achievements. We have over 80 years of experience in educating graduate nursing um, students uh, and midwifery students. The, our FMP program is the first and one of the oldest uh, programs in the United States. Last year, 2020, we celebrated our 50th anniversary of the FMP program. Students and alumni represent every state in the United States and we have over 80,000 graduates. Next slide. Dr. Arterberry. One of the, the, the things I love most about FNU is the student support that um, we give for our students. And you can just see on this call, every uh, office that can benefit you in some way is represented on this call. Um, so in the clinical aspect, um, you will be assigned a regional clinical faculty who is uh, familiar with the area where you practice and they will actually come to see you in your clinical sites. Um, you have clinical preceptors that we offer training to all of our preceptors. Um, you have your academic advisors. Uh, I think we have one of the best academic advisors in the, in the university. Um, online student mentoring groups are available for you. Look at financial aid and scholarships. They're right here today to help make sure that you have what you need. Online uh, library services. Frontier does it right as far as it relates to distance education and making sure that you have everything that you need. Um, and we also have a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's a diversity impact program so that everybody, every student feels um, supported and feel like they belong to the organization. Next. And here are some of our degree options. Thank you, Dr. Artiberry. Uh, Frontier Nursing University confers the MSN. We also confer a postgraduate certificate, which is known as the PGC for applicants who already have um, a master's in nursing and who hold a certification uh, coming back for a second certification. Uh, FNU also confers the DMP. It is a direct admission process that starts with your MSN program, meaning that when you are admitted into the MSN program, you are also admitted into the companion DMP. Here's some of the time frames for moving through the program. We um, exist on a term system. We have uh, four terms per year. Each term is 11 weeks with two weeks between each term. Uh, the MSN can take two to three years, depending on if you move it, move through the program with two courses a term or three courses a term. The PGCs uh, take anywhere from a year to a year and a half. And then the DMP program, which is post MSN, you'll have, will need to have finished the MSN is 15 or, or 18 months. Next slide. Okay, Rainey, would you like to uh, present these slides? Sure. Uh, one of the, some of the admissions criteria are listed here and they're also listed on our website. But um, the first one is that you must have or hold a current RN, an active RN license with no encumbrance, um, a bachelor's degree in any field, a GPA of 3.0 or higher in your highest nursing degree and you must be uh, in good academic standing in your prior educational work. And also in addition to that, one year of RN experience. And next slide, I don't know if that's mine as well. Okay, and so on the PGC admissions criteria, you'll see the, all of them just about the same with the exception of you must be hold an APRN and the, the following fields, ANP, CNM, FMP, I won't read those to you, but uh, you can see them there, but you must, in addition to the 3.0 and the RN, um, the master's degree, you must be an advanced practice nurse in one of the following fields. And our upcoming deadline 
for the winter 2022 term is just what nine days away July 21st so and that's on a Wednesday so guys get your packets ready and get your um, application started and the coursework for um, that it will be January the 4th I believe for the January term and your application steps you'll complete an online application and then it will send you a link to where you will upload the documents required, which are an essay, your resume, two references, three professional, I'm sorry, two essays, did I say what it says? And two or three professional references and your official transcripts. And please know that your transcripts must be official and final with the GPA. And uh, for those who hold a, an, uh, an ADN, but have a, a bachelor's in another field, you can apply for the MSN degree with the portfolio option. Um, tuition is currently at $636 per credit hour, and the majority of our courses are three credit hours per term or per course. So you can do the math on that. And um, so and always check our website for any tuition and fee updates. I think that's me, Rainey. Um, I am the clinical director, and so I really love the clinical portion of our program. And I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what that looks like. So if you're coming in as an MSN student, you will be required to have a minimum of 675 clinical hours to complete the program. And I say minimum because we go by not just clinical hours, but competencies. So we, some students may go a little bit over that. There's a minimum of 16 weeks of clinical experience. So if you take that 675 and divide it by 16, you're gonna get that you can do up to 40 hours a week of clinical. If you're a PGC, you come in, I call you one of my specials, you come in and you get credit for the first uh, clinical course. So you will only have 540 clinical hours that you would need to complete. Each clinical course is 135 hours. And that take, will take you uh, approximately 14 weeks of clinical if you're going full time. Um, but you can extend that out um, by going um, less than 40 hours a week. The companion DMP uh, requires an additional 360 clinical hours, and we would love for you to stay through and get your DMP, but that's something you can think about. Um, as far as your FMP clinical requirements, you need to complete all of your didactic coursework before you begin your clinical um, requirements. It is where you integrate all of that didactic coursework and actually utilize it in your um, in your clinical practicum. Thanks, Dr. Artaberry. And um, audience, this slide just kind of gives you an idea of the team approach that Frontier takes toward um, educating students. Um, I'm the department chair. Dr. Artaberry is our clinical director. Each course that you would take has a course coordinator who's the lead faculty in the course. And in each course, there are course faculty who work closely with students. Um, some of our courses are fairly large. You may be in a course with over 200 students and faculty are assigned um, according to student numbers. Another key person for your education is your regional clinical faculty or your RCF. This person um, works with you during the clinical part of your program. They um, guide you through your preceptorship hours and meeting the criteria for completion. And it will be a very, very important to, person to you at the, the latter part of the program. We have a very strong academic advising department that you will meet um, early in your um, time at Frontier and they will work with you through your time and is one of your key contact people. Also, we have clinical advising departments that will help you through the clinical um, hours who help you um, with um, paperwork and getting your clinicals in place and kind of help you work through that process. The financial aid office, uh, 
Rainy Boggs just spoke to you. She's also over the financial aid office. And this is a really big, important part of our university. And then your credentialing coordinator um, is the person that will help you with the paperwork for your um, clinical site. Dr. Arterberry, would you add anything to any of that? No, I just want the students to understand that if you have a problem or an issue, there's a person who is waiting and willing to help you solve it. And so we have all of these departments, but they work very closely together. And a lot of times we'll be on a call, Jamie, we'll be on a call with a student, their RCF, their clinical advisor, and it'll be a group of us trying to make sure that we are there to meet the student needs. So I really want the students to hear that. It's not like that everywhere, but it is here. Thanks, Dr. Arterberry. Next slide, please. Dr. Arterberry, let's talk for a minute about our life as a family nurse practitioner. Would you um, provide us with just a little synopsis of the work that you've been able to do as an FMP? Oh, wow. Um, being a family nurse practitioner has never been a mistake for me. I started out as a um, labor and delivery nurse and the school I went to didn't have nurse midwifery. I wasn't, I actually applied at Frontier way back in the day, but um, I became an FMP and it expanded uh, my role. The ability to be in my community, to be a healthcare provider, changing outcomes, improving the lives of my, um, my, uh, the patients that I serve has been something that still gives me warm fuzzies and I do it as a volunteer at a free clinic now so um, I don't think it's a uh, I think you made a good choice by looking into family nurse practitioner as a career option. Thanks, Dr. Arterberry. And I had been a nurse for 20 years before I became a family nurse practitioner, which I've been one 26 years. And I think, Dr. Arterberry, you've got a year on me. You've been 27 years, I believe. Um, and I agree with Dr. Arterberry. The some of the one of the beautiful things about being a family nurse practitioner is you are prepared to care for patients from birth to geriatrics, both genders. You will be prepared to care for patients with episodic problems. You'll be able, you'll be prepared to care for patients for with chronic health problems across years. Um, your ability to work in different settings is very nice. And I've worked in a variety of settings as an FMP, rural health care, emergency room, uh, student health at a college, uh, psychiatric facility. Um, in a mobile van over the years. And that's one of the greatest things about being an FMP is your versatility and the different things that you can do through your um, work. Also, correctional medicine. I spent some time working in correctional medicine as an FMP. So your um, what you bring is um, greatly enhanced. And, you know, you don't leave your nursing experience and your nursing work behind you bring it with you as a foundation to build on as an FMP. Next slide please. And resiliency. Um, you know as nurses we are resilient. We are um, tough. We can make decisions in a in a, a rapid manner. But I just wanted to to say to you the definition of resiliency. It's the ability to adapt well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And as nurses, we do this. And resiliency is such a great characteristic that will not only help you through graduate school, but help you in advanced practice. Next slide, please. Um, here's some uh, pictures of our brand new campus in Versailles, Kentucky. Um, there has been a great deal of um, remodeling and building for these beautiful buildings on the campus. And we will be returning to campus in fall of this year. Um, as a student at Frontier, you would be required, as I said earlier, to come to campus twice during your time as a student, once for Frontier Bound, which is orientation, and once for Clinical Bound, which is a very clinically focused preparation time for you. 
Next slide, please. Um, let's stop right here. And um, if you will uh, turn your microphone on, uh, Dr. Arterberry and I would love to be able to answer any questions you have about what it is like to be a family nurse practitioner. What are the benefits of that education? You can place your questions in the chat box if you'd rather put them there. Trisha, I see you unmuted yourself. Do you have a question for us? Yeah. Um, I just, um, with the family practitioner, right? Say that um, you work, you work as a labor and delivery nurse and you go for your practitioner degree, where would it lead you like for a job? Um, I, can, I can tell you that um, as you become an advanced practice nurse, it really expands uh, your role in the healthcare of your, of your patients. So we teach you to be a uh, ambulatory care, primary care type provider. So it would um, take you out of the labor and delivery area and probably put you more in a more family practice area. There are family pr practice of uh, FNPs who work in specialty areas like neurology, uh, GU, uh, GI. They work in those specialty areas, but they are, we train you as a generalist um, to come out and start practice. So um, generally it's in a clinic type setting um, that you'll find yourself working. Um, I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but I'm happy to hear a follow-up if you need more information. Okay, and one more question. Regarding the program, right? Does the program start next fall? Is we, uh, no, we admit students every term. So mm -hmm. depending on when you apply, you know, you, um, fall this coming fall rainy correct me if i'm right is the next admission cycle so applications by that particular deadline we mentioned earlier you would enter fall if you waited until october and it and submitted your application you would start in winter which would be january of 2022 so we admit students every single term which is actually four times a year. We're different than other universities where they only admit once a year. We admit four times a year and we teach every course, every term. So you don't have to wait a year to get a course if you need it. Randy, would you add anything to that? Uh, yeah, actually, Lisa, the deadline that's coming up next week or, you know, like nine days on July 21st is for the winter 22 term. Oh. Good. So those so those applicants actually would uh, begin coursework in January, and guys, you all would be the first frontier bound group to actually attend or you know be present on our brand new campus. So and the following deadline would be in October, and that would be for our spring term. Okay, thank you for that, Rainy. You're welcome, and I'm going to post the link to the deadlines um, and the terms in the chat. So just for a quick reference, if anyone wants to look at that. And my last question, because um, I just came on last minute, um, what's the what's the tuition price for the school? It's currently six hundred and thirty six dollars per credit hour, and I'm just going to give you an estimate of what it would take based on the current tuition rate to go through the program. Okay. Now, this is going to be for your tuition and fees throughout your whole program. I want to calculate it really quick. Um, so don't hold me to this. Uh huh. Is it only full time? Um, no, you have, there's two different programs of study. And Lisa, you probably want to follow up on that. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, they, <laughs> you can um, move through the program taking two courses a term, which is six hours at the graduate level, or you can take three courses a term, um, which is nine hours at the, at the graduate level. Okay, so you have part-time and full-time then, basically. Basically, yes, but six hours doesn't always feel like part-time. <laughs> oh. Yeah, right. it is. Graduate, graduate education is very different than undergraduate. And um, no matter, you'll be busy at six hours. At six hours a term, you will be busy. Go ahead, Rainy. I think I interrupted you. Oh, no. And, and in regards to full time and part time for financial aid, five credits and above is considered full time, that frontier. Four credits and below is part time. But like Lisa, Dr. Chapel said, we do have two programs of study where you, know, you can take less um, courses per term. But like she said, it may not feel necessary, necessarily like part time, but, but it is a. Um, a slower program of study if you want to slow down just a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, Rainy. And I think that as a student, you really need to look at school as part of your life as a whole. You know, you may um, have to work. Most of our students do have to work coming through the program. You may have children at home, small children or teenagers that you need that family time with. So how can you come through school um, needs to be really thought through and planned out for you to be successful. And many, 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 many students, actually probably more students take two courses a term and do perfectly fine moving through the program. And that gives them time for their family and for their work if they're having to work as nurses. And I saw a question in the chat box about um, financial aid, Rainy. Okay, and I also put in the chat the estimate for the tuition and fees is going to roughly be around 42000 Now that's going to include your frontier bound fees, um, your tuition, your tech fees, your clinical bound fee, and the grad fee. But again, please don't hold me to that. I just uh, punched it in real quick on my calculator. And uh, to answer your question in regards, Sadie, in regards to what the income limit for financial aid is, that doesn't matter here at Frontier. And the reason is because you're, you're, grad, you're graduate students. So regardless if your income is $3,000 a year or $300,000 a year, you will be eligible for the same amount of financial aid because it's going to be federal student loans. Once you obtain your bachelor's degree, you're no longer eligible for federal grants. Does that answer your question? Okay. Lisa, there's another question that you might be able to answer. What percentages of applicants to the FMP program are admitted? Hmm. Actually, Rady may be better able to answer that. Um, Randy, would you say it's 50%? I'm sorry, Lisa, I was reading another chat. What was that question? How many, what's the percentage of applicants that are admitted to the program? Is it 50%? Roughly, yes. I don't have that figure in front of me, but I would say that's a pretty good guesstimate. Okay, good. Any other questions before we move on? How are the exams done online? The um, <clears throat> exams are um, monitored through a system called Proctorio, where um, students have their camera on, have their microphone on during the exam, and it is recorded. A Proctorio will flag the recording if there's any question, and then faculty go in and review the recording to see and identify any concerns. Um, it is, um, you have to check into Proctorio with your identification, uh, but it does help uh, secure our exams. If we're between FMP and site, do we apply for both? No, you will need to 
apply just for one program at a time. Uh, we don't have students who come through dual programs. It is It would be absolutely too much work. One thing to consider is um, you could finish one program and then come back as a PGC into your second program. For example, a really nice educational preparation would be come through the FMP program, which establishes a strong foundation of advanced practice and then add site mental health as a second certification. So that would be a very well-prepared clinician. That is something to think about too. Any other questions? Okay, I have MSN, do I apply for the post? Is your, are you an advanced practice certified nurse? No. Is your master's like in nursing education or nursing administration? Yes. Well, <clears throat> you will need to apply just as a regular MSN entry, but you may be able to transfer some of your courses in. Uh, you would need to have had, for example, if you've had advanced pathophysiology and it was taught as part, if your school had a, uh, had a um, like an FMP program that taught it and it was from that curriculum, you could get credit for that, but you may be able to get transfer credit for some of your courses. But you, one of the things that, you will need to graduate, but also to sit for certification are the three Ps, advanced pathophysiology, advanced physical assessment, and advanced pharmacology. Three hours in each of those to be able to graduate and sit for certification. So we're, we're very careful with that to make sure that when you finish, you've got what you need. Any other questions before we move on? You guys hear me? Yes. Hey, it's Catherine again. Um, you guys answered my question about the FMP and Psych and P program. I have another question. I am in Oklahoma. I know you guys have like someone that helps with kind of navigating the clinical sites. Um, but do you guys? I'm just kind of worried about being accepted to the program and going through it and then not having anywhere to do clinicals. Um, do you guys help with that, like in depth, as far as trying to secure placement or Dr. Arterberry, you want to answer that question? Yes, and I'll be happy to have Jamie pop in too on this one as well. Um, we do consider you a part of the team as it relates to finding your clinical sites because you're probably the one who knows your community best. Um, if you run into snags, um, uh, your clinical advisors will help you with that. Um, uh, and, and occasionally we have students who are in clinical who lose a site and their RCFs become their go-to person to, they have developed relationships all over the United States. So they are able to say, hey, I have this student who lost a site, can you take them? That kind of thing. Um, but we do consider you to be part of the process. And Jamie's gonna talk about how they help you find sites prior to even getting to clinical. So when you go through our clinical outreach and placement session at Frontier Bound, um, we will show you how to navigate our community map. And that's essentially a big database where we have over 10,000 sites and over 10,000 preceptors that past students have utilized. And so you would have access to look at this um, large map, put in your zip code, put in keywords, and we would show you how to do that. And then you're able to see what sites may have been utilized already in your community. Um, now, I always tell students, if you are in a really rural location, you know, maybe you don't know any FNPs that live near you, or maybe you're in a really large urban area with um, competing universities, med schools, other NP schools, those students could potentially be your competition. Um, if you're in a really rural area and you don't have any providers near you, then it's possible that you're going to have to travel um, for clinicals. So those are all, 
you know, things you want to be thinking about. Um, but we're here to walk you through that process. And then I always tell students it's never too early to network. You know, you can start poking around on the AANP site, um, getting your name out there, you know, kind of seeing. Um, so we'll help you through all those kinds of things too. But, you know, we do tell students ultimately it is your responsibility to secure clinicals. We're here to be resources, um, you know, myself, your RCF, you can chat with fellow students who might be in your area and you have access to see all of that on the map as well. So we don't leave you um, blindly to do this search on your own. What else did I miss, Dr. Artaberry? I think you did uh, great. And again, hearing that there will be someone there to help you. Um, with, you know, coming through COVID, sites got really, really tough for our students, but we were able to continue to keep our students moving forward with the help of the team, so. Okay, thank you guys for being so thorough. That does answer my question for that. Going back to the question that I had, um, I, I'm i just in between applying to the psych NP or FNP. Psych has always been kind of a passion of mine, but I don't have the experience in it because I lived in a rural town. So all my experience is really like meta surge. So I think I would be just, you know, based on experience, uh, be a better candidate for FNP. Dr. Arterberry, I know you mentioned do FNP. Um, I would like like your professional experience and so far, you know, your career experience as well, as well as why do you guys, why do you think FNP would be better as far as like starting off or just kind of get your feedback since I'm kind of, you know, I'm a new, new nurse. I would just appreciate your feedback on that. Sure. I think the, the again, one of the, the best things about FMP is the broad expanse of education that you get. And a lot of times you think that you're really set on doing one thing when I became an FMP. I didn't think that I would really like nursing home, but it became one of my favorite places to go. I didn't think that I would really, you know, so it exposes you to a lot more to see if that's really what you're going to really like. Um, you'll get some psych mental health uh, experience in FMP. It'll be very small compared to what you would do in psych mental health, but it gives you a great baseline, a great starting point, a great place to jump off to see what it is that, you know, you're really passionate about. Um, and it allows you to work in multiple sites and areas and to, so that you can find that, that real passion. If psych mental health is 100% what you want to do, then by all means do psych mental health. We have a great program. But of course, I think FMP is the best program anywhere for anybody at any time. So um, I might be a little biased on that one. <laughs> well, Dr. Arterberry, let's talk about some unbiased facts. And I'm talking about our certification rate in the FMP program has been, um, there's two certifying bodies, American Nurses Credentialing Center, which is a branch of a and And we've had 100% pass rate for our graduates for the last three or four years at ANCC. The other certifying body is the American Academy, I'm sorry, American Association of Nurse Practitioners. And we have been either at 99 or 100% certification pass rate for the past three to four years. Now, these are objective measures of, of a program and how well prepared the students are to sit for certification and practice. So that's something that, that tells you how strong our FMP program is. Oh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I see a couple of questions, but let's let's move forward on the slides. Okay, um, Rainy, I saw a question a minute ago about how many FMPs apply and how many get in. We said about 50% of those who apply get in. I'm not sure how many we have apply every term though. I just looked up, Lisa, for the fall term, the most recent, and we had 100 plus, around 130, uh, 130, I think. 100, no, it was actually about 125. Um, and then, of course, we accepted 68 of okay. those students. But remember, students do go on um, a wait list. 
So just because you don't receive an offer does not mean that all is lost. You'll be on a wait list. You know, I see from working with students a pretty good uh, turnover as far as students coming off of wait list and being admitted. I see that frequently happen. So yes. a wait list does not mean you're not admitted. It means that you are waiting to be admitted and many people will move on from wait list to full admission. What, what other questions do you have for the admission department? Uh, Dr. Arterbury, thank you for asking that question about the classes. You know, Frontier really has a commitment to asynchronous learning, and you will not be told by a faculty, we have class every Wednesday at 9 a.m., you have to be in class. We don't function that way. Um, faculty, if they do a presentation, it will be recorded, and we know that most students are working, so it will be recorded, and you'll have access to it at a later time. One thing that you might see is that you have to do some type of presentation in your course and you faculty develop a sign up list so you'll be able to choose the day and time that you would have to do that presentation. But we do not say to you, we have class every week, we have live class every week and you have to come. We don't function that way. Randy, would you like to add anything to the admission information? Yeah, I was I was answering uh, Carol's message in the chat, but I'll go ahead and answer here so everyone can also see it. Um, each file is reviewed by two faculty members, and each faculty member does not know what the other one or how the other one scores the applicant's file. And they use a rubric scoring system and it's based on several different um, pieces such as your GPA, if it's, if it's in a certain range you'll receive so many points, your extracurricular activities or volunteer work or published work you'll receive so many points, um, you know, and, and different things like that. So to, to pick one item out to say that this is really what makes your resume or your application stand out, I can't really in point one, but I will say a well-written, well-written essays, um, time management essays. Those are those are strong points of your application as well. Um, Brandy, do you see this question in the chat box? Yes. Yes, we do. If you attend another program that you didn't finish, whether you withdrew or you were dismissed or whatever, we just ask that you provide a separate statement explaining why and what happened. And, and that will be reviewed and it's part of your application as well. So yes, but we do. It's, it's not a, you know, a no go. Thank you, Rainey. You're welcome. Let's go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, Jamie, what would you like to add? I would say um, in terms of thinking about sites and preceptors, you want to start the process early. And so that's why, like I said, we have a session at Frontierbound. So we're just planting that seed early. We want you thinking about clinicals really from day one. Um, ideally, we would like your clinical plan in place six months prior to your clinical bound. And that just ensures plenty of time for credentialing and whatnot. Um, and I don't want to stress you out by giving you kind of that six month time frame. But the point is, we don't want you leaving this till the last minute. So we have um, the CB 101 course, which gets you in there early. Um, there are several small assignments in there um, that we have you do um, in the first term or two. And again, that's all to get you thinking about clinicals early on. Um, we are happy to meet with you one on one. Um, we love individual meetings. We know everyone has a different story and situation. And you know, we will wa walk you through any and all of this information. So again, it's not like you're alone out here at all. 
um, I would say being flexible, you know, thinking about competing universities in your town, could that be a barrier to you, you know, thinking if you're in a rural community, could that be a barrier in finding placement, um, those are the kind of things we just kind of went on your radar early on, but we're here to help guide you through the process. Thank you, Jamie. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is one of our graduates. Um, and the saying is, success doesn't come to you, you go to it. So you have, this program is um, a good program, but it you will be required to work through the program and work hard some days. So just know you go to it. Next slide, please. Dr. Artaberry. So what's next steps? Next steps is for you to go to frontier.edu, look up more information. Um, everything that you do moving forward is gonna require that jump, that leap of faith. So um, this is a decision that you're considering. I think it's a great one. Um, so to get your career started, um, just ready, set, jump. That's all you have to do is to go and do it. Go to it. Don't wait for it to come to you. Next slide, please. Rainy. Hi, again, I just want to reiterate it's nine days away, guys. No. Um, so like Dr. Arterbury said, go to frontier.edu, begin your application, and it will provide you with a link. Once you complete your application, you'll receive a link and you'll create an account. And that's where you will upload your documents, your essays, your resume, and request your three professional references. Your references are actually, it's a form that you provide the email address to, and it shoots off a form to them and they fill it out and it's uploaded back. And your transcripts, you will request those. And a lot of schools will send those electronically. So we will receive those electronically or you will, um, your, the school will send them, they'll mail them here. And the admissions officers, once they receive those will actually upload them to your application itself. And because as you probably know, it does take some schools a little bit of time to submit or get those transcripts out. So you want to do that really quick. So even if before you even complete your application, maybe go ahead and request your transcripts to be sent to us. Thank you, Rainy. Next slide, please. Okay, um, first I'd like to thank all the faculty and staff who came and participated in the presentation today. Uh, we have a few minutes before our time is up, so please feel free to ask any other questions in the chat box or turn your microphone on and let us hear from you. No, we do not require statistics. We used to, but no longer. We do have a course called Epidemiology and Biostatistics where you will be exposed to statistics. So we're not putting statistics down, but you don't have to have it for admission now. Hi there, this is Amy. And I just wanted to ask you about um, if, uh, if someone has ADN and uh, doesn't have BSN, but has MSN, would you still consider that or? Would that be a problem? I didn't understand you exactly, Amy. Did you say you had an ADN? ADN, and then I did MSN, ADN to MSN, right? Uh, those programs are into MSN? We don't I have, have that. She has her MSN. She mind. went through an yeah. ADN to be a, to MSN yeah. program. Yeah, oh, thank you so much. I just jumped through the BSN. I did it, but they didn't give me the certificate. So it was just the program was ADN to MSN, right? So um, would that be an issue? So you already have an MSN? Yes, in nursing no. education. Yeah, you would, no, you can apply. You do not have to have, if you've got an MSN, then you can apply, yes. Okay, 
And then is there any state that uh, you guys don't accept a student from? Um, we are, New York State is one state that we are working with to get um, the ability to allow students to enter. Dr. Oh. Arterberry, do you know of any other states outside of New York? That is the okay. only one. Right. Oh, okay, state of Washington, then that's included. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Uh, Frontier, okay. Frontier is very, very good about paying attention to the boards of nursing and meeting yeah. whatever criteria there is so that we can have students from each state. But right okay. now, New York is the only one. Okay. And then what about uh, Canadian students? Do you guys accept that or not? I'm sorry, what kind of student? Did you say Canadian? Canadian. Yes. I'm um, just asking. <laughs> all students have to do their clinical in the United States. Yeah. And so you have to have a, a nursing license um, and you really need to have an address in the United yes. States. Okay. Because we don't we don't send faculty out of the country to do your site visits and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. No, I'm from U.S., but one of, one of my friends wanted to come down here and do her too. Well, tell her to come live with you for a couple of years and y'all come on and go together. And I think that will be a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So you, I live in New Jersey, so I wouldn't be, I wouldn't qualify. You would qualify, but you would not be able to do clinicals in New York. A lot of people try to go from New Jersey and go over to New York and do clinicals, but that is not, that is not an option for you at this point. You would have to do your clinicals in New Jersey or another state around you, not New York. Not I New have York. a question. Go ahead. For the tuition and fees, does that include your text as well? Everything like combined or text separate? That is, so in each term, the only fee that you will have, or the only charges you'll have per term is your tuition and a tech fee. And your tech fee is $250. It's, I've been here for 10 years and I think, I, I think it's been 250 ever since I've been here. So that is, that's what you will be charged per term, except for the term that you come back for clinical bound, then you will have a clinical bound. And your tech fee and your clinical bound fee is all covered by financial aid by your student loans. Okay, Can I answer your question? and then my second question, I'm from North Carolina. So y'all would send someone here to do like my clinical evaluation, is that what I'm understanding? Right, yes. And then my last question, if I start in the, the term of April 4th, usually how long is the entire program? So if I start in April, when should I anticipate in graduation? Um, and you are, just for the MSN portion, I believe we said a minute ago around two to three years, depending on if you come through two courses a term or three courses a term. And whether you go to clinical full-time or part-time, you can go to clinical, you know, 40 hours a week, or you can go 20 hours a week. Um, so that would lengthen you a little bit longer if you were going to clinical less. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Randy, do you see that um, question about transcripts? Yes, I answered it. Um, oh, thank uh, you. Well, I think. Oh, I think I answered it directly to someone else. Sorry, <laughs> I answered it just not correctly or in the right in the right place. Uh, we accept transcripts. You'll need to su to supply transcripts for your nursing degrees and courses and or courses nursing courses. And I, so if you have a degree in architect, we don't. I see there's a question about what are the pre-required classes. Um, April, did we answer your question already? 
I think so. But I know someone asked about statistics. Are there any other like pre requirements besides just having the RN current, DSN, GPA, good acad academic standings, and a year of RN experience? Right. No, uh, the other course would be physical assessment, but and it has to be a three credit course from an accredited university. And correct me if I'm wrong, Katie, uh, a regionally and nationally accredited university, and um, it has to be at least three credits. And even if, if you don't have physical assessment, you can take it here. We will build it into part of your program of study. Right, we teach it here. What other questions do you have? Okay, I'm not hearing or seeing any. Um, I hope this has been helpful. We would love to see you apply and come to Frontier. We are very proud of our university and our graduates who do very well out in clinical practice. Uh, thank you again to everyone who came from the university to participate. Um, if you have questions, I'm sure any one of us would be happy to answer them. Um, so thank you for taking the time to be. Bye-bye, everybody.